Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're going back in time a little bit to take a look at this machine, the Southwest Technical Products 6800 Computer System. Got to make sure I say the name right. I recently had a video on the second channel where I showed a really old, potentially kit slash homemade slash made by a company, but a one-off computer that was given to me. And if you haven't seen that video, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what the details around that computer are. And actually, by the time you see this video, I may already know a little bit about that machine. But unlike that one-off computer, this machine here is actually somewhat historical of a computer. But yet, it's something I had never personally ever heard of until just the other day, actually. And then I ended up with one of them. So without further ado, let's take a closer look at this thing See if I can even get it working. I mentioned in the intro that I thought this computer was historical. And when you think about computers that are known in history to be significant or groundbreaking in the realm of home computing, it all goes back to the original Altair. Before the Altair, computers were pretty much relegated to companies or universities or governments, and not really to the home. So when Altair released that first kit computer, it really was quite revolutionary. But it wasn't long after the Altair came out that other kit computers came out on the market for home users. From my understanding, it was only about six months later that the MSI 8080 came out, which was actually really just an Altair clone. But this was another machine that came out around six months after the Altair did. So it was in later 1975, the Southwest Technical Products Corporation, that's their logo right there, released this machine, the 6800 computer system. Unlike the Altair and the MSI, this actually uses the Motorola 6800 8-bit microprocessor. The Motorola chip in this, very much like the Intel chip, was an 8-bit processor. It supported 64K of RAM and was relatively groundbreaking for its capabilities, but also its low cost. Now, there's one big obvious difference between this computer and the MSI and the Altair, of course, is the front panel is really pretty boring looking, having just a power button and a reset switch here. This clear part of the case here is actually just that. It doesn't actually have any lights or anything behind it. So this is it for this computer. Now, while the blank front plate on this is a little less sexy than the one on the other machines, this computer actually was a lot more functional in that all of the control of the computer was done through a serial port on the back, which you would combine with a terminal or a teletype so that you didn't have to be flipping switches to load programs. You could actually directly load programs off of paper tape, or even cassette with an adapter through that serial port. Later versions of Altair's computers and pretty much all the other kit type computers that came out after this also had the ROM based monitor with the serial port and did away with all those front panel switches. Now this particular computer was actually saved from going to e-waste and given to me. And I think a lot of the reason why it was almost sent to e-waste is because it doesn't have that sex appeal that those other machines have, nor the cachet or like the notoriety so that someone looking at this computer might not realize what it is and just toss it out. Now, this particular example is a little bit rough and ready in the condition department. The front panel is actually not that bad. It's missing a metal trim piece that goes around the front and I'll, I'll show a picture of it here, how it should look. I think that part's gone because if you take the cover off of this, you have to remove that trim piece first and there's one on the back as well. And then you can take the cover off. And if you're going in and out of the computer a lot, it's probably annoying and you just did away with it. But because of that missing cover, there's a little like dents and nicks in the corners of the front plate here, which would be mostly hidden if, uh, the, if the trim was actually there. Another interesting aspect of this computer is that the top cover is entirely made with this metal grate here, which allows really good ventilation of the system, meaning that there is no fan installed in here, which is unlike the Altair and the MSI. And of course, back then, those fans would have been mains powered fans and quite noisy. So nice that this machine is dead silent if you're using it at least with a CRT based terminal as opposed to a teletype, which are very noisy on their own. 
Flipping the computer around to the back, we have two DB25s here, one labeled control, one labeled nothing, uh, two extra spots for DB25s, and then four holes that you can run cables through, I guess. And the power cable just sticks through the back like that. It's two prong, it's not even grounded, but this was the old days. It's not like there was any kind of RF shielding on this machine or any kind of safety whatsoever, actually. And just like the Altair, this machine here was sold only as a kit. So you could buy all the parts to make this and you got the case and all the circuit boards and the power supply and whatnot, but you still had to put it together yourself. It meant that you included all the ICs, the circuit board, stuff like that, but you had to do all the soldering yourself. But one thing about this machine compared to the Altair, which was pretty significant, besides the visual difference and the ROM-based serial monitor, stuff like that, this machine was really, really inexpensive. At the time this computer came out, it was definitely a competitor to the Altair and was pretty comparable as well. Both were kit computers, and this ad, which was from May 1975, shows the Altair price here. $439 for the kit with the assembly instructions. If we take a look at this brochure from around October 1975 for the 6800 computer system, you can see here that the complete kit was $450 US, which was actually slightly more expensive than the kit form of the Altair, but there's actually one big difference. If we look down here, it says that the basic kit only includes the Altair, the CPU, and the front panel. It didn't come with anything else, including RAM or any I.O. cards. To add 1K of RAM cost you $176 or 4K for $264. When we take a look at what the 6800 included, you can see here it includes the MPA, B, C, D, F, M, and P. Well, let's break down what each of those parts are. So MPA is the microprocessor system board. So this included a little bit of static RAM, 128 bytes, I think, the clocks, the ROM to get the system booted, and the processor included the motherboard, which has the address decoders. It included MPC as well, which as you see here is a TTY current loop or RS-232 terminal interface board that was included with the kit. That goes back to what I was saying earlier is that unlike the Altair and the MSI, there are no controls in the front of the machine. You do all of the setup configuration and execution using the machine language monitor that's included on the ROM. You got the chassis cover with aluminum and black finish, but right here you got MPM, memory board with 2K of static memory, expandable to 4K with the MPX kit below. So for your $450, you actually got the serial board and the memory board with 2K that you didn't get with the Altair. You could buy an additional 2K of RAM to go up to 4K total for another $45. So if we imagine here that you buy this system and you wanna upgrade it to 4K of RAM, you're gonna need the $450 plus the $45 here. So you're at $495 total for the kit. Meanwhile, for the Altair, you're spending $439 plus for 4K, $264 more dollars for 693. And if you wanted to have a serial port as well, you need to add that board, which I'm not sure how much that cost, but it says they did offer it here. Just as a reference, I'm using the consumer price index inflation calculator. The $693 that the Altair cost with the 4K RAM is the equivalent of $3,700 in today's money. Compare that to the $2,600 for the 6800 system. There is one other consideration. On the Altair, you could use the front panel to do simple calculations or create little programs that flash lights or do whatever but ultimately wasn't super flexible when it came to using the computer as what we would consider a computer today. As I mentioned on the 6800 computer, you had to hook up something to the serial port that was on this interface, this control board right here. And if you got this computer without having any way to hook it up to something like a teletype or a serial terminal, you actually weren't able to use the computer at all. Southwest Technical Products Corporation did actually sell a computer terminal kit and it was $275, so definitely not cheap at all. And here is a picture of that assembled kit, which is actually an iteration on the original TV typewriter, which was pretty much the very first device in 1973, which let you hook a computer or at least a keyboard up to a monitor and see text displayed on it. From my understanding, one of the big improvements on this later version was that you used static RAM as opposed to shift registered, which allowed you to move the cursor around and edit any part of the screen. 
One other thing to consider is that this kit did not include any kind of monitor or CRT. You had to use your TV set or a security camera monitor like seen here. Now, if we add the price of the terminal kit to the 6800 computer, it was $770, which was more than the Altair with the 4K of RAM. But remember, for $693 for the Altair, you're still getting a computer where you have to interact with it through the front panel, and that's it. Meanwhile, on the 6800, for $770, you got a computer that actually had a keyboard and a monitor while well, you hook it up to a monitor, and then you can interact with it with a keyboard, which was much more how we expect to use computers even today. Now that we know a little bit about this machine, let's open this thing up, take a look inside. Now, normally there are, I think, 14 screws that hold the top cover on. And of course, that trim piece is installed on the front and back, which completes the look and also um, makes it a little bit less sharp along the edges here. I only have two screws installed in here because when I got this computer, it didn't have any screws installed in it whatsoever. The machine itself was actually in pretty rough shape. It was very dirty, and there's definitely evidence that this was stored in a let's say less than ideal environment. Since this machine has been in the basement, all I've done to it is clean it up a little bit because it was really quite dirty. The power supply section here, you can see there's a, quite a bit of rust on the transformer. And of course, the fact that the case is open on the top means that any kind of moisture or dirt or whatever can fall straight down into this. So this is obviously rusted over time. It shouldn't cause a problem though. And if this computer ends up working well, I could take the power supply out or take this transformer out and give it a little coating of rust converter and then black spray paint. The way this power supply works, it's very common for machines of this era. The mains comes in, it's reduced to a lower AC voltage. There's a bridge rectifier right here that's mounted upside down onto the chassis. The output of that is DC and it goes into this large filter capacitor here, which then feeds to this board, which makes its way to the power connector, which is currently unplugged, it's right here. And that's what goes to the motherboard. The large cap is producing around roughly eight volts on regulated DC, which when it gets to the motherboard and these cards, they have voltage regulators on them that bring it down to the five volts. And this little board also has four diodes and two capacitors on it along with this fuse. And this generates a plus 12 and a minus 12 volt unregulated DC. And that goes to the motherboard as well through the power connector right here. That would almost certainly be for serial lines or any other chips that need like a plus 12 or a minus five and they would use voltage regulators on those boards locally to actually generate those voltages. Now you might think these caps don't look quite right, and that's right. The two that were on here had bulged and were in really bad shape, so I actually replaced them. These are modern 1000 microfarad Nichicons, and I didn't have the axial type, so I just stuck these in here for now. I suppose if I want to try to restore this to something that looks a little more correct, I guess, I would use some axials, but to be honest, this is totally fine like this. And this large cap here, which is made by Mallory, I actually unplugged the leads here and used my bench power supply and a very low amount of current to actually reform this over a long period of time. So this cap is also working perfect. But I have not yet connected power to the motherboard or any of these cards because I wanted to do that on camera just in case anything goes catastrophically wrong. Now let's talk about the slots here. There are seven slots in the front and there are 50 pins each. These are for the CPU card and all the main expansion cards that essentially need all the address and data bus lines, all the signals that are from the CPU. And then on the back of the motherboard, there are seven more slots that use a smaller 30 pin connector. And the reason for this is because there are actually some ICs down on the motherboard right there. You see them here. And these actually do address decoding. And each of these slots is addressable with zero through seven right here. So each one of them has a few bytes of address space associated to them. So when you plug a card into this slot right here, it's just like on the Apple II where you can address that at a specific memory location because of the address decoding that's on the motherboard here. The S100 bus machines didn't have anything like that. And nor do say the ISA bus on the PC. It doesn't matter where you plug a card in, it just works. And you have to map the IO space or the IO address space so you can address that card properly. It is my understanding that the benefit of doing this address decoding on the motherboard here allows for much simpler cards here because otherwise you'd have to be doing all the address decoding on the card itself. Now this right here is the serial console card. So this is what you would hook your serial terminal up to when you boot the computer. And you can see here that there just is not a lot going on. And that's all because of the fact that the motherboard is doing that decoding. 
Another big difference between this motherboard design and the Altair S100 bus is look at the connector. It uses these sort of Molex connectors and these very thick pins on the motherboard, and it's like that for all of the slots. It's a very substantial connection, and actually, I already took these cards off once to sort of clean the motherboard a little bit, and it was really, really hard to get them off. They were almost stuck on there. So let's go through the various cards on this motherboard. We'll start with the one I have in my hand right here. This is the MPC, which is the control card. I'm pretty sure that stands for, and it's connected to the control port on the back of the machine. And it is serial, so there's just uh, three wires here. And this uses the Motorola 6820 chip right here, which is from my understanding, a parallel IO chip. It is not a serial UART or anything like that, but a parallel one. And the monitor ROM that's on this machine actually bit bangs serial over this parallel chip. And I learned this fact after binge watching a bunch of videos on this computer on this great YouTube channel, which uh, I'll, I'll show a picture of it right here. It's a small channel where the creator has shown off many of the cool things about this computer. And I've learned quite a bit. So without his channel, I would have been having to do a ton more research, reading documentation and whatnot. And what I learned is that the monitor ROM that's included on this thing, and it's on the CPU board, which is beyond the camera view right here, that was actually made by Motorola, and it's a mask ROM. So it was already off the shelf, and the way that ROM addressed the various components in the machine, like this bus over here and whatnot, was already predetermined. And because this card is a hard-coded design for that Motorola ROM, it can only work at 300 baud or 110 baud, and there are two jumpers right here to configure that. So when we do test this thing out, it's gonna be kinda slow. The serial connection on the top of the board uses that same type of pin header arrangement as on the motherboard. So I've unplugged that there. This card here is an MP-S, so another OEM card from Southwest. And as you see here, it has a baud rate selector up to 1200. And I'm pretty sure this is MC6850 chip is actually a serial chip. It's not a parallel chip that is bit banged but that hard-coded ROM will only work with that other one, and we can't get 1200 baud for the terminal or like you know, the console out of this thing. The next card that's in here is the MP-LA, which I'm pretty sure is like a parallel IO card. So it's much like the user port on the VIC-20 or the PET or the Commodore 64, which allows you in software to toggle IO pins off and on right here. So this would be good for not just hooking up, say, something like a printer or an LCD screen or whatever externally, but you could hook up sensors or other external peripherals to this thing and have it all go through this MC6821, which I'm pretty sure is a very similar or compatible chip to the I.O. controllers that are on the PET for the keyboard, as an example. Okay, moving on to the large cards here. Let's see if I can get these out. Okay, they're much easier to remove now. When I put them back in the machine, I use deoxid on the connectors, which of course has a lubricant in it, which allows you to get the cards in and out a lot more easily. The first time I tried to get the cards out, I actually broke some of the plastic standoffs that hold the motherboard down uh, because they're just the little clip ones you push in and push the motherboard onto. They broke off. I just actually installed some metal standoffs under the motherboard on this side. So now it's held in actually more securely than it was even originally. All right, the next board here is the MP-M board, which is another OEM card. It's a RAM board. Now, originally when you bought this, if you got the kit computer for $395, you got this board and it came with 4K of RAM here and one of these voltage regulators. Actually, I think the kit might've come with the expansion memory as well. So what they did is when they sold it to you, if you wanted to save money, you could opt for a 2K system where you installed half the RAM and then later you could buy the additional RAM and the voltage regulator and put that on and you'd end up with a 4K board. That's what we have going on here. Unfortunately, the markings on these chips are all pretty much worn off. They seem to have like a plastic casing to them. These are static RAM chips. And one of the reasons why there aren't a whole lot of chips on this RAM board is it doesn't need to worry about doing DRAM refresh. So static RAM was a little bit expensive back in the day, but it definitely simplified the overall design of the whole computer. Looks like this chip here actually has a marking that is visible. It looks like it's a 21L02 from 1977, 21st week. And that coincides with pretty much all the chips that are in this machine. It seems like this was a slightly later machine in that it was purchased in 1977 versus like when it first came out in late 1975. When this machine came out, computers were advancing so incredibly rapidly. 
Like what came out in 1975, this machine was very quickly outdated by machines that came out just a couple years later. And if you look at the Apple II, that's a great example that in 1977 when the Apple II came out, it had graphics and sound and a keyboard and everything was all built in and expandability and a switching power supply just a couple years later. Even the grandfather of these machines, the Altair, was actually discontinued from my understanding, the very first model at least, in 1978. I'm not sure when this machine was discontinued, but I can't imagine that it went much longer after this machine was purchased. There was a later version of this machine that I saw pictures of that seemed to use the Motorola 6809 processor. And that was the same processor used in the TRS-80 color computer. But I have a feeling that people who bought this and invested in this early model here were probably using it for quite a while because it was still a very functional machine. Back to the hardware that's in this machine here, I'm just noticing right here, there's a little jumper link that has an A and it's put into this little pin here that says seven. I wouldn't be surprised if this jumper selects where in the memory address space of the CPU, this RAM board shows up. This probably indicates that this shows up at 7,000 hex. All right, let's try to get the next board out of here. Oh yeah, these are easy to pull out with the deoxid. That's awesome. All right, so this board right here, this is the CPU board. This also came with the computer or the kit, of course. It's the MP-A. Here's the Motorola 68000 right here, 1977 day code, 26th week. Over here on the board, we have two ICs. This one right here, I'm pretty sure is that ROM chip here. It's the 6810. This is that monitor ROM I talked about that was hard coded to address like the console port on that specific serial card or a parallel card. And right here we have an MC6830P8. Quite sure this is static RAM. I think it's 128 bytes. And the static RAM is mapped into a fixed address space, I think at 8,000 hex, which is directly used by the monitor ROM for storing registers, stack information, stuff like that. What's neat is even without that other RAM board installed or working in the machine, this static RAM, if this works, should be enough to get this machine up and booted where I can at least type in commands and read and write to this memory in that little tiny address space there. All right, moving on, there are two more boards in here. Let's pull out this front one here. Ooh, it's really, really stuck in there very firmly. But there we go, it came out. All right, so this is a RAM board, and this one is not made by Southwest. And if you, you'll notice right here, this is made by Smoke Signal Broadcasting. It looks like it has a serial number of 2877. And on the front side of the board here, it says SSB for Smoke Signal Broadcasting M16A. So that would be a 16 kilobyte RAM board. And notice here, there's a couple chips and sockets. So I guess uh, they have gone bad. And at some point in the past, someone has replaced them. These are TMS 4044s from Texas Instruments. I think these chips are 4K by one bit chips. So you would need eight of these to equal 4K total of eight bit memory. Meaning that of course this board has 16K on it. I definitely don't have any RAM that is like this. So I don't think it'd be too hard to take a 16K static RAM chip, for instance, and just wire that directly in to like this select logic right here in the address data bus lines and kind of replace all of these with just one IC. As I had mentioned that this power supply on this board is unregulated, each board needs its own voltage regulator. And this one obviously has a larger one because there's more ICs on here. So they're using a bigger uh, five volt regulator with this heatsink here. In addition, there's dip switches here, which almost certainly is for selecting where in memory this stuff is mapped into. And I wouldn't be surprised if this board is configured right now into address space 000 at the beginning of RAM. I'm noticing here there's a little bit of damage caused by those two sockets when they were installed. A few traces were lifted. So if there's a problem on this board, I can always double check to make sure that uh, this is not more of a problem. Without things like the Hako and desoldering iron and other hot air stations, it would have been hard to get these chips out of this board. All right, we're down to the last card that's in this machine. Pop this one out. This is a floppy drive controller. It's got the FD1771B, which I'm pretty sure is the exact same chip that is used in the TRS-80 Model 2 that I was working on. I was thinking that this chip here is probably a ROM chip because I mean, there needs to be a ROM on this board. 
This is a 74S474N. I'm gonna have to go look up what that is exactly. And then this right here is the Motorola 68. 21. So that's like a parallel I.O. controller chip, which is used for what? It's to control the floppy controller, it looks like. So instead of hooking the floppy controller directly up to the bus, they're driving it through this uh, parallel I.O. chip. That's interesting. This board here is from 1977, smoke signal broadcasting as well. And does it have a part number on the top? I don't see it just says Hank White, number 13104. Is that who put it together or is that who the owner of this machine? Oh, it does say right here, BFD68. I know at the time this controller came out, there were other controllers that came out for this machine right around that same time period. Like the one made by Southwest Technoprox actually connected to one of these IO connectors on the back here. And there was a replacement ROM that went on the CPU card to replace that Motorola one that had commands that would directly address the uh, floppy controller made by them. So you could like boot directly off a disk really easily. But there were other cards that plugged onto these slots in the front that had ROM chips right on them that contained the DOS or the disk operating system for the drive. So you didn't even need to take up any space on your floppy disk to use the drives. You just executed what was in the ROMs here from the machine language monitor. You just issued one command and then you were up and running with disk drives. Hopefully this thing works in a similar way. And if not, then hopefully I can find the manual to try to figure out how this thing works. A quick Google search does reveal that the 74S474 that is on this board right here is indeed a four kilobit PROM. I'm pretty sure that's four kilobit. Yep, 512 bytes by eight bits, bipolar PROM. That means that you could just execute code straight out of this and it's only 512 bytes in size, which isn't a whole lot. But I wouldn't be surprised if this is mapped to the C000 address space so you can just go right to it to start booting your floppy disks. I spent some time Googling for the manual for this particular disk controller card, but I actually couldn't find it. I did find this advertisement for it. It looks like it came with this external drive chassis. It does mention here it has a built-in ROM for booting right off your floppy disk. But the problem is it seems to indicate there are two different versions of DOS one that loads into 7,000 hex and one that loads into D1000 hex. I searched around for disk images of them and I found one actually on archive.org, but it's the version that loads into D1000. And now we've looked at the RAM boards that come with this machine. There is no memory on this machine up in that higher range where this DOS disk wants to load. So if anyone can find a scan of the original manual and also an image of that DOS disk that loads into 7,000, that'd be really helpful. And that completes the tour of the Southwest Technical Products Corporation 68,000 computer system. What a mouthful <laughs> that is. In the next video, I'll be diving into this machine to see if I can get it actually up and running after all these years. Who knows the last time this thing was even powered up, let alone worked. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to this computer. I've been finding this absolutely fascinating. I know very little about this 70s era of machines, at least before the PET and the Apple II and the TRS-80 came out. This sort of homebrew kit stuff is quite unknown to me and I find it so fascinating how it was like such a, an open community. People were hacking and modifying the hardware and companies were cloning each other and making all sorts of interesting machines. After doing some research, I found that this particular machine was the basis of a whole bunch of other computers that were 6800 and 6809 based. Even that smoke signal broadcasting company that made the RAM card and the disk drive in here actually made a version of one of these computers with the same bus connectors as this called SS50 and SS30, and then it had built-in disk drives as well. It's really fascinating to me that this was an alternative to the S100 bus, which I thought pretty much took over the entire world when it came to home computers, at least until personal computers came out like the IBM PC and the Commodore 64 and of course other stuff like that, which this completely obliterated anyone wanting to use these types of machines. And that of course happened in the 80s. So anyhow, if you liked this video, thumbs up. If you didn't you know what to do, hit that subscribe button, you know, all the good stuff. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. 
If you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. And of course, a huge thanks to the local viewer here in town who donated this computer to me and actually saved it from being e-wasted. So thank you very much for that. It's been a fascinating journey, and I know there's going to be more interesting videos around this machine. If you want to know more about this machine, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel that I showed earlier. I'll be putting a link in the description of that. There's cool info there about both this machine and the Altair. So that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.